Hey, Grade Nines, and welcome to Unit D, Electrical Principles and Technologies. Today, we're going to start off with Topic 1.1, which is about static electricity. How does, an actual, how does an electrical charge actually form? And in order to discuss that, we've got to look back to Unit B, where we discussed, discussed the structure of the atom. Now, if you might remember from Unit B, we discussed that the atom is made up of several subatomic particles. There are positively charged protons that are found in the nucleus. There are neutrally charged neutrons that are also found in the nucleus, and there are negatively charged electrons which surround the nucleus in a large open space around the, the nucleus of the atom. Now we know that an atom has equal amounts of both po of positively charged protons and negatively charged electrons. So for that reason, atoms do not have a charge. They are neutral because they have an equal amount of negative and positively charged uh, components. However, we did discuss, and in the case here up on the board, we've got an example of, uh, uh, of, of beryllium, which has uh, an atomic number of four, but we also know that atoms can lose electrons or gain electrons, and they can become what are called ions. So in the case of beryllium, if I want to make beryllium into an ion, it's quite simple. If you look on your periodic table, basically an ion of beryllium has a charge of plus two. So in order to get a charge of plus two, we actually have to remove two of the electrons. So basically now, all we've done is we've removed two electrons and we've created a positively charged cation of beryllium, which has a positive charge of two. And you can check that on your periodic table because that's what the, an ion of beryllium is. It has a charge of plus two. And remember that um, non-metals are gonna be forming anions, which are negatively charged. So for example, if you had chlorine, chlorine would actually gain an electron to get that negative one charge. So you can take a neutrally charged, you can take a neutrally charged atom and make it charged by either uh, adding or removing electrons. Uh, and, and that's, we've already discussed that. So that's not, not really anything new for you at all. Um, now, what we should discuss though, are the interactions between these positive and negatively charged substances whether it's a proton or an electron, or whether it's a, um, a positively charged ion or a negatively charged ion, they are gonna interact with each other in specific ways. If I have two, two positively charged substances side by side, they're actually gonna repel each other. They don't wanna have anything to do with each other. And if I have two negatively charged uh, substances that are beside each other, they're also gonna repel one another as well. They're, they're, they're not gonna to wanna to have anything to do with each other. However, if I put a positively charged object or a substance or a subatomic particle beside a negatively charged one, there's going to be an attraction between them. The old adage, opposites attract. And that's exactly why we say that, because opposites, in fact, do attract. Uh, in this case, it's a positive and a negatively charged substance that are going to attract one another in this case. But what if I take a charged substance and put it beside something that's neutral? What if I had, let's say, an ion? positive or negative, and I put it beside a atom that has no charge, what would happen then? Well, we may not be able to see what happens there, but we can take a look at this from a larger perspective, and we're going to discuss uh, what's called uh, static charge and uh, a charge separation. So you probably have done this before at some point in your life. You've had a birthday party. You've had balloons. And uh, the old party trick, you take a, a balloon and you rub it against your hair, or what's left of your hair. So in this case, what we have is we have a balloon that's negatively charged. It has an equal amount of positive and negatively charged particles in the balloon, so it is neutral. However, if you take that balloon and you rub it against hair, or against maybe a carpet or some kind of a substance, uh, you know, arm hair or something like that, what you're going to do is you're going to actually create a situation where electrons are going to actually gravitate into the balloon. We're, we're not going to lose protons or gain protons, but we are going to, in fact, in this case, gain electrons. Now, by doing that, by adding these electrons to an actual substance, we are given it what we call a static charge. And, uh, and we know what happens when we take a balloon and uh, you put it after you've rubbed it against your head and you put that balloon beside the person, uh, the hair, if it's long enough, would actually now stick to the balloon. Uh, there is some kind of an attraction there. 
uh, which is weird because the hair, in theory, should be neutrally charged. The other thing you could do with the balloon, and you may have tried this as well, is you can take a balloon and you can rub it against the hair or carpet, and then you can actually place it against a neutrally charged wall. Now, what happens there? Well, in this case, we get something what's called charge separation. If you've tried this before, you know what a balloon will do if you put it up against a wall. It will actually stick. Even though the wall is neutral, the balloon itself now, when it has this static charge, has got a negative charge. But the wall is neutral. But here's what happens. When you take that balloon and you move the balloon toward the wall, what happens is this. The positive and negative particles in the wall will begin to align one another. They will align. So the positive charges in the wall, which are attracted to the balloon, will move closer to the balloon, whereas the negative charges in the wall will move further away from the balloon because they're repelled because of the negative charge of the balloon. We haven't made the wall positive or negative. All we've done is we've separated the charges in the wall, and that's why the balloon will stick to the wall, because the positive charged particles in the wall are closest to the balloon now, so there is an attractive force there, whereas the negatively charged particles in the wall actually move away, and that's why we call this charge separation. So we're not giving the wall a charge, we're just separating the charges in the wall, and that's what's creating the attractive force between the charged object and an object that's neutrally charged. At this point, you may want to just quickly uh, click the link up here if you want to do a quick review on static charge. Uh, you only need to watch about the first six or minutes of the video or so. And uh, you know, if you want to watch it, go ahead and the link is right up there. All right. So what happens when this static charge builds up? Well, eventually, there is going to be some kind of a discharge. The charge in the statically charged object wants to go somewhere. And we see this all the time. If you rub your feet on a carpet and you're walking across the room and then you go touch a door handle, you will get a shock. Or maybe you'll shock someone who's sitting in a chair beside you. Uh, you know, we, we've all had that, that static, uh, static discharge. Um, there are some good examples of how you can create this. There's a wonderful um, invention, or I guess a, a device that's, that can be found in most science labs, including at MCHS. They're called Van de Graaff generators. And Van de Graaff generators are wonderful uh, you know, little devices. And if you want to see a Van de Graaff generator in action, you can actually click the link right up here right now to take a look at a, a Van de Graaff generator in action to see what they actually do. But what a Van de Graaff generator does, it actually creates a static charge inside of it. And then when an, any object comes close to it that actually has uh, the charge wants to jump. It, it, so if you put your hand close to the Van de Graaff generator, uh, it would literally, my hand was right there, you'd see a little, you know, there'd be an electrical uh, discharge that would happen uh, from the Van de Graaff generator that's actually gaining this charge to me, and it would actually jump from the, the Van de Graaff generator into me because I'm technically neutral. There would be that charge separation that we just talked about. Another example of electrical discharge, which is probably one of the coolest things in nature is lightning. And lightning is, is essentially a static discharge on a massive scale. We've discussed lightning already this year and its role in the nitrogen cycle, how it actually creates, uh, it, it can split nitrogen in the atmosphere to, to do the process of nitrogen fixation, which is a huge important role in the biological world that actually allows nitrogen to be used in food chains. But if you want to see um, a really cool video on, on lightning right now, uh, you can click, oops, you can click the link right there uh, uh, to, to watch that video as well. It's a great little video on, on, on uh, you know, kind of really cool facts on lightning uh, if you're interested in that. And that pretty much covers topic 1.1 1 .1, uh, of the electrical unit. Uh, at this point, I would ask that you basically complete, uh, in the textbook, you're going to complete questions 1 and 2, uh, 4, 5, and 6, and questions 8 and 9 on pages 278 of your textbook. And uh, thanks a lot for tuning in. And we'll see you next time uh, for our, our next lesson.